All right, good afternoon. Here we are again for another lovely session of ENGR 2302, Engineering Dynamics. So we're going to pick up where we left off last time, and we are going to continue through some material on um, the kinematics of rigid bodies. Okay, so let us begin. Now the first thing I want to do is work through an example problem covering some of the uh, material we saw in the pre in the at the end of the previous lesson, and this is just going to be another example problem. So example here, I'm going to look at a uh, a piston, a um, simple piston and crank. So consider I have a um, a sort of channel here that one piston will be. Um, active in that will be moving back and forth. So here's my piston channel. This is a unmovable support, and then the piston will be sliding back and forth inside here. And then I'm going to have a, and then I'm going to have a uh, piston within here. So maybe something. Oh, maybe I'll do dark red or something. I'm going to have a piston here that will slide back and forth within the guide channel. Um, within the guide channel. And there'll be a pivot here. There will be a support here. There'll be a support here, a pin support here, like this. And there will be two um, individual rods here. There'll be a rod here and a rod connecting the, the other, uh, this crank. So, but overall, this is just a crank mechanism connecting, uh, so a piston connected to a support with two rods, as shown. All right, so I have a, uh, this thing is going to be rotating around and around and around and around. This one's going to be going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So essentially what we're doing is we are converting um, rotary to linear motion or vice versa. So we have this here. Uh, let's say this is three inches. This will be a radius of motion. This thing will be rotating around. R is equal to three inches. And then we have a, a crankshaft with a length L of eight inches. With a length of eight inches. So L equals eight inches here. And um, at a particular instant, we have the following angles. So we do, at a particular instant, we do know the geometry. And at a particular instant, we will have an angle of uh, 40 degrees here, oh, not 4 degrees, 40 degrees, and I will call this angle from the center line of the crankshaft to the horizontal, I will call this beta. This is beta here. And then some point labels, well, this is going to be A, B, then I'll have some point in along here, um, point C, and then point D, which will be on the piston itself, which will be the, um, well, actually I'll just call the joint D and then maybe a surface P at the edge here. Okay, so <clears throat> all of this is given, and also I'm told that um, crank AB uh, has a constant uh, counterclockwise counterclockwise uh, rotation or angular velocity omega of um, 200 RPM or 2000 RPM, sorry. And I wish to find A, find A, uh, the angular velocity of a connecting rod, a connecting rod BD, and uh, B here, the linear velocity or the velocity um, of piston P, of that piston head there. The velocity of piston P, as shown.
All right, so um, now let's work through this. So a uh, solution, this is going to be a multi-step problem, that's okay. Our first step will essentially be to determine the absolute uh, velocity of point D. So A uh, steps, I should say maybe one, determine the absolute velocity the absolute velocity of point D. Of point D. Um, via, well, I'm going to use the velocity of D, the absolute velocity of D, is equal to the velocity of point B uh, plus the velocity of D with respect to B the velocity of d with respect to b here. Uh, let's see, so then um, I'm, I can maybe draw this out a little bit. And what I would have is, I would have a little, um, I can look at this element here. If I want to define what uh, velocity d is, let me, let me actually define, sorry, if I want to define what velocity b is, um, again, I have this uh, part of the crank arm, this piece of the lever, or what, what do you want to call it, rotating, and it would have a certain angular velocity, uh, omega AB. So this is uh, point A and B, and this is omega AB. And then there is a velocity B. So velocity B has a certain, um, actually let me label this a little over here, omega AB. So crank arm AB has a, um, an angular velocity omega AB and overall absolute velocity VB. And I want to actually find that value. So omega AB, uh, omega AB, well, this is equal to 200 revs per minute, revolutions per minute, per minute, and then transformed into radians uh, per second. So that's going to be uh, one minute over 60 seconds times uh, two pi radians per revolution. Per revolution. And that comes to 209.4 uh, radians per second. Uh, 209.4 radians per second. And at first that seems quite high um, but then you realize, whoa, this thing is turning at 2,000 RPM. That's, uh, that's pretty high. So 209.4 radians per second isn't actually that um, uh, un unexpected in that case. So then I can say, okay, well, VB is equal to, um, I can say the length AB, length AB, um, or maybe I'll just say, uh, I, I labeled it before RAB, so let me do that, RAB times omega AB, the angular velocity. So in other words, the linear velocity is equal to the radius times the angular velocity. And this will be equal to three inches times 209.4 uh, radians per second. Here, uh, 209.4 radians per second. All right. Mm, okay, so we can use that then. Um, let's see what else we're missing. And then I want to find, uh, so, so we have that, uh, that comes to, let's see, let me get this really quick. I don't have this in my notes, but let me calculate this very quickly. Um, I would actually like to give a numerical number to that, or numerical value to that. So 3 times 209. Uh, yeah, I got 628.2. Uh, meters per second, or I guess this would be inches per second. Inches per second. All right, so 628.2 inches per second here. And then um, I also might say, uh, so now I need to use that to try to work out um, VD, VP, etc. Okay. Uh, so moving along. Now, looking at this, 
point D here, its uh, absolute velocity must be horizontal. Uh, D can only move back and forth, left and right, so it's not going to go up and down, it's not going to rotate, so therefore point D must be moving horizontally. So I can say the um, direction, the direction of, of absolute velocity VD is horizontal. Um, then this means, thus, uh, the direction of relative, uh, the direction of relative velocity of V of um, V of D with respect to B. Uh, is perpendicular to BD. Is perpendicular to BD. Is perpendicular to BD. Um, and then if I want to compute the angle there, uh, I want to compute beta. Uh, I, need, I do need to have beta um, from the previous diagram. And that's just the law of sines, and that's fairly easy to get. You can just say beta, that's just trigonometry, is equal to 13.95 degrees. Uh, then <clears throat> I can say here, um, I would perhaps want to create a vector triangle like this. So I know um, that uh, this here, well, let's, uh, let's think about this, if I have um, this here. So let me um, illustrate this with a little drawing here. I have um, BD here. And let me break down the velocities of BD. So I have B and D. And uh, then I'm going to have uh, the velocity BB which I know is an angle of 50 degrees, so actually that shouldn't, I don't want to make clear, that's not vertical, it's um, like this, VB. And this angle between, along the center line here, or from the center line, is 50 degrees. This is 50 degrees. Again, that is 50 degrees. Um, so again, that's from there. And um, again, how we got that was acknowledging that VB here, um, VB has to be perpendicular, because this is a rotation, rotational motion, VB here has to be perpendicular to the, um, to the uh, radius here. And so that means that uh, if I look at the angle of BD here, it's going to be an angle, of, if I look at the angle of velocity B from the center line of BD, it's going to be 50 degrees. And then uh, the angles, or sorry, the horizontal force, VD, is going to be like this. It's going to be purely horizontal. And uh, just like I did previously, where I looked at, where I looked at uh, absolute and relative motion, or plane, general plane motion, etc., I can say that this is the summation of two things. It's going to be translate, so plane motion is a summation of translation plus rotation. Uh, plus rotation. Translation plus rotation. So um, if I looked at the translation here, I could just say that both ends were moving at VB, VB, and VB. VB and VB. And then um, if I treated this as a fixed joint here, uh, maybe if it was rotating about B, there would be an omega here, and there would be a velocity of um, b with respect to d. 
velocity of uh, d with respect to b. So d with respect to b. And if I work through the trigonometry here, again, um, just by working through the trig, I can find that this here will be 76.05 degrees, uh, 0.05 degrees, and this here will be, uh, this here will be uh, 13.95 degrees. And let me show you how I get that. I want to work through a velocity triangle. And I start with having my, the, I will start the fact that I know my VD. I know that VD is purely horizontal. I don't yet know its magnitude though. But I do know that it's going to be purely horizontal. Then I can say that I know uh, with, with B though, VB, I know both its uh, magnitude and direction. It's going to be 628.3, uh, um, uh, I suppose. 628.3 inches per second. Uh, and then, and this again, this is VB, as we calculated earlier. And then I also know that it's going to be at an angle of 50 degrees. So this is known. Fifty degrees, and then I know that velocity of uh, d with respect to b would be would be completing the triangle. That is velocity of d with respect to b, and that would simply be completing the triangle. Uh, and so, look, I have a magnitude, I have a direction, and I know that this one is horizontal. So. If I know that, well, what do we have? We have side angle angle, essentially, right? We know that this is 50 degrees. We know this is horizontal. Um, and let's see, what else, what else? And we also know um, uh, beta here. Beta coming from, uh, I know this beta here is this. I know this angle. Um, I know this was 13.95 uh, uh, degrees. And this came from the, um, because I knew it had to be, perp this came from the actual geometry. I knew beta had to be 13.95 degrees because this, this beta comes not from a velocity triangle, uh, but simply from uh, from the trig, from trig on the machine itself. We're not looking at velocities there, we're just looking at the geometry of the machine. Uh, but uh, on the machine's geometry. All right, and then uh, the rest can be solved for fairly easily using um, trigonometry. And if I do this, I can find that uh, VD, so if you apply trig to this triangle here, now that we have this alpha, suddenly the rest is just the law of sines. some basic trig, and you can get that VD is uh, um, 523.4 uh, inches per second, which is also equal to VP, or I could say it's 43.6 feet per second, if I would prefer that. And then finally, I could find uh, omega uh, BD if I wished. Oh, and al along the same grounds, I could say that V D with respect to B, well, that's going to be equal to 495.9 inches per second. Again, this is all coming just out of very straightforward law of sines. And then omega, um, omega B D is going to be equal to V D B divided by the length of that item. And so that's going to be 495.9 inch, inches per second divided by 8 inches, and that comes to 62.2 or 62.0 uh, radians per second. And I will say that's in the k direction because it would be a, this is a plane geometry figure. So if I ever have something rotating about the xy plane, the vector for that rotation 
is going to be in the K direction, or in other words, out of the page, or into the page if it's rotating the other direction. So, all right, questions on that? I know that was quite a bit. Hmm. Okay. So any questions on that? I know it was quite a bit of material. Okay, everyone got really quiet. All right, so um, if there's no questions, I want to move along to the topic of instantaneous center of rotation. Instantaneous center of rotation. So our first new bit of theory today, uh, instantaneous center of rotation. Let us consider the instantaneous center of rotation. So uh, let me draw another, um, well, let's, let's go through this. Maybe I can draw a potato first, because I like potatoes, apparently. Or I should say a generalized plane shape, or a potato, because we all know there's all those two-dimensional potatoes lying around. Uh, so consider an object with general motion. Uh, maybe there's a point A. And it, it has a velocity, VA, and then there's some rotation of the figure about point A. So VA, and then there's some rotation, omega A. Uh, so the plane motion of all particles in a shape or a slice uh, in a slice uh, can always be retraced or replaced always be replaced uh, be replaced by the translation of about an arbitrary point A about an arbitrary point A Um, and a rotation about A, a rotation about A, A that is independent of all um, choice of A, is independent of the chosen A. In other words, you can define translation however you wish, depending on which part, which point you choose. But uh, the angular velocity is is going to be the same regardless of where you choose. Uh, let's see here, and I can also say here uh, the same translational and rotational. Uh, velocities at A are obtained when doing something when looking at a different point uh, by allowing the slab to rotate or allowing the slice to rotate. Uh, to rotate with the same angular velocity. angular velocity at some point C, or at a point C, about the point C, uh, about the point C, on a perpendicular to velocity at A, or on a, yeah, on a, a line, or on a, perp uh, on the perpendicular to velocity at A on the line um, perpendicular, I should say out on the line perpendicular to A's velocity. To VA. 
All right, so I could try to draw that if I had a chance. Let's see. Again, so the same translational and rotational velocities at A uh, can be obtained by allowing the slice to rotate with the same angular velocity about the point C on the line perpendicular to BA. So um, let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, in other words, I could have the same potato or the same slice. And if then I could have a, uh, even if I considered a point C up here, and if I considered a point C up here and point A, if there was the same, um, the original VA here, the original VA here, well, if this is perpendicular, uh, I would still have the same omega and the same VA if I used a transform system. And then I can say the velocity of all other parts or particles, of all other particles, of all other particles in the, in the slice, uh, in the slice uh, are the same as originally, as originally defined, uh, since the angular velocity uh, and translational velocity to A are equivalent. And translational velocity at A are equivalent. And then um, I could say, as far as the velocities are concerned, the velocities are concerned, uh, the slice seems to rotate about the instantaneous center of uh, rotation C. about the instantaneous center of rotation, uh, the instantaneous center of rotation C. The instantane instantaneous center of rotation C. All right. Okay, so some other ideas, an instantaneous center of rotation. Here, let's consider this. All right, so let's look at another thing. Uh, so we will work through an example of this, don't worry. I know, I know this uh, when, when in very, uh, uh, in, in more uh, qualitative terms, this can be difficult to wrap your head around, but we will work through a numerical example. Uh, so if I have a potato, again, another uh, potato slice, or a generalized arbitrary body, I should say, or a potato if you prefer, generalized arbitrary two-dimensional plane shape, there we go, that's nice and, uh, nice and uh, technical for us. And let's say there are two velocities, uh, I have two particles, a particle at A and a particle at B. If I know at one, some instant the velocities of each of them, of each particle, um, say VA and VB, well, I can actually find just by simple, uh, by a very simple geometric relationship, the instantaneous center of rotation. And maybe I'll actually put this a little further back because uh, I think that's gonna make a cleaner line. So let's say A is here. and it's going to occur at the intersection of the perpendicular lines. Here, 
where this is a right angle and this is a right angle. So this would be the instantaneous center of rotation. So again, let me maybe write this out. Um, if the velocity at two points is known, or on two particles is known, at two points on a body is known, or are known, I should say, uh, on a body are known, are known, uh, the instantaneous center of rotation, the instantaneous, uh, instantaneous center of rotation of rotation uh, lies at the intersection uh, at the, of the perpendiculars. At the intersection of the lines perpendicular to the velocities and passing through A and B. To V A and V B, but passing through A and B. A and B. So if you know two velocities and you want to find the instantaneous center of a rotation, you can just take perpendicular lines from the point of application of those, of those velocities. All right. Uh, next, uh, some other things here. Uh, if the velocity vectors are parallel, If the velocity vectors are parallel, well, then they won't meet up. I can take the perpendiculars, but the um, they won't necessarily meet up. Um, so the instantaneous, uh, well, actually, no, they, they may, depending. Uh, here, I, I, sorry, I shouldn't say that they won't meet up. I should say um, the instantaneous the instantaneous um, center of rotation is at infinity. So I guess maybe they won't meet up. I guess that's right. Um, is at infinity. Infinity. And the angular velocity is zero. In other words, if you would, I should say, if you have, you know what, I might actually modify this by saying if they're parallel and um, parallel and of equal magnitude is probably a better way of stating that. So if you had uh, two velocity vectors here, or if, um, yeah, if something like that, if you have a velocity here and velocity here, well, these will never meet up. Or if I were to draw perpendicular lines, they would never meet up either. OK? And some other items. Um, if velocity vectors A and B are perpendicular uh, to the line AB, kind of like in this case, are perpendicular to the line AB, to the line AB, uh, the, let's just say instantaneous center of rotation, the I-core, uh, lies at the intersection, uh, the intersection um, of AB, of line AB, uh, with the line joining the extremities or I should say the points or tips maybe would be a better description. Tips of vectors VA and VB. Let me draw that out. VA and 
BB. VA and VB. Okay, so let me draw that out then. Uh, I'll show what I mean by this one, by the previous comment. So say I have um, velocity A and velocity B, and uh, there's or point A and point B, point A, point B. So there's some line joining A and B, that would be line AB. And let's say there is some sort of, let's say they somehow line up a bit. In other words, these are perpendicular to line AB. So this is VB, VB, and VA. Now, the instantaneous center of rotation would be at the intersection of the line joining their extremities and this line here. So I have this line here, and then the line joining their extremities, or their tips. It's basically a triangle, a right triangle. So this is the instantaneous center of rotation. And let's see, what else do we know about these? Uh, one other trick, if the velocity magnitudes are equal, if the velocity magnitudes are equal, are equal, um, the instantaneous center rotation is at infinity and the angular velocity is zero. The instantaneous center of rotation is at infinity. Um, so again, if the velocity magnitudes are equal, the instantaneous center of rotation is at infinity, and of rotation is at infinity. And the velocity and the angular velocity is zero. And the angular velocity is zero. All right, so let's keep working through this here. Okay. Oh, let's, so let me draw out a system, um, again, showing maybe two sliders, for similar to what I saw, um, similar to what we looked at last time a bit, or in, at the end of last lesson. So let's say I have a one piston here, or one, uh, yeah, or just one support here. This is B, uh, move it, that can move vertically, and A, uh, which can move horizontally. This would be um, A here. And so VB, and there's a pin and bar joining the two of them. Here. And then let's say we have VA uh, moving to the right, and VA, and sorry, and VB moving down. Now, the instantaneous center of rotation is going to be where the perpendiculars of these velocities meet, and that's going to be up here. The, we're looking for the line that passes through this point, um, through the point, but perpendicular to the velocity, and that would make the uh, instantaneous center of rotation here. So this would be our C, and which means we basically have an omega around that. We could consider an object moving, at, this object is rotating about that point at a particular instant. And of course this thing has length L and um, an angle theta at a certain time, at a certain instant. And so uh, we know when the, we know that it, again, we know that the, uh, we know that the center of rotation, the instantaneous center of rotation will lie at the intersection of these two perp perpendicular lines, lines perpendicular to uh, velocity A and velocity B. And then um, for our, uh, for some math on here, for the, for the mathematical relationships, omega is going to be equal to VA 
divided by AC, or length AC here, or V, um, and w where I'm getting this again, this is going to be, if, if I think about uh, V, it is R times uh, omega, right? And the radius here is, uh, the distance from the center here is uh, essentially just AC. I could just call it LAC. And then it's also equal to um, VA. I could also say distance AC is um, equal to L cosine <coughs> theta. Well, that's not one cos, that's L cosine theta. And uh, then I could say, I, I, and then I could also say if I wished, that VB is equal to BC times omega, uh, which is equal then to L sine phi, uh, or L sine of theta, times VA over L cosine theta, over L cosine theta. So in other words, what I just did was I said that uh, I solved the VB for uh, omega. I, I wrote an expression including omega. And then for VA, though, I'd already solved that expression for omega. So I'm plugging this omega, this expression in for omega. And now the L's will cancel out. And I will get that VB is equal to VA tan theta. VA tan theta. Might be useful. Cool. VA is equal to VB tan theta. And so I can interpret this as saying, OK, at this instant, uh, at this instant, the motion of all particles, or the velocities of all particles, uh, this instant, the velocities of all particles act as if they are rotating about point C. Uh, rotating about point C. So I don't need to, um, I shouldn't say I don't need to worry, I should just say that at a particular instant, I could look at this and um, the particles here would be indistinguishable from a uh, from a from an identical from an identical system that was rotating about C. Now, if I uh, let a tiny fraction of a second go by, this will come down further and this will move further to the right. So B will go will drop down, and A will move to the right, and that would result in my um, center of rotation moving both down and to the right. But at this particular instant. It's right here. Uh, and um, some other things, some other things to note. The particle at this center of rotation has a velocity of zero. Uh, at this center, if so, if there is a particle, there often isn't, but if there is, the particle at the center of this rotation uh, has a velocity of zero. Uh, has a velocity of zero, and um, what else? Again, the location of the instantaneous center changes with time. We mentioned that um, of instantaneous center changes with time. That's why it's called the instantaneous center rather than like a fixed or permanent center. Uh, changes with time. Changes with time. Um, let's see. So uh, the velocity may be, may be zero, but the acceleration of the particle at the center is not zero. Even though, even if the velocity is zero at that instant uh, of the particle uh, at the center of rotation is not zero. is not zero, even if its velocity is. Even if its velocity is. 
And uh, let's see what else, a few other notes. Uh, the acceleration. Uh, of the particles in the slab or in the slice. So we can turn we can determine the velocity at every point inside our body by saying, okay, uh, let's just treat it as if it's rotating about there. About, uh, we'll treat it as if it's rotating about the center of, of the uh, of rotation. Now we can do that for the velocities. We cannot do that for the accelerations. Um, the accelerations of the particles uh, in the body, cannot be found simply by treating them as rotating about, uh, uh, simply as treating them as rotating about C. Because this rotation is temporary. It's just a, it's not a real thing. It's not actually rotating about that point. Uh, by treating the particles as rotating about C, It is only an instantaneous center. And, okay, and that's the basic idea. And that's the idea of instantaneous center of rotation. Okay, so let's see. What else can we do? Okay, um, maybe I'll work through one example problem and then we'll go and take a break and come back and look at some new material. Okay, so um, let's say I have this. Let us say I have a double gear. Um, let me do it like this, let me write this out. Uh, consider a double gear. Now I'm going to totally screw this drawing up. I can tell you that right now. And I'm going to have a, um, a, let's say a stationary rack and a upper and a moving upper rack, I believe. Yes, that makes sense, I believe. Um, let me think about that. Yes, so I'm gonna have two uh, racks on here. Now, let me kind of draw a circle, an inner circle, and an outer circle. And an outer circle here. And this one is kind of tricky. So let's say this is a, oh, I'm just gonna draw it as a tooth gear. Just a spiky gear instead of a square gear. That'll be a lot easier to draw. I like this. So I'm going to have two gears that are joined together, an inner gear and an outer gear. It looks like a mutated sunflower or something. Isn't dynamics class exciting? Um, you get to watch me draw diagrams. Um, anyway, now the upper gear is going to be, there's going to be a, oh, let me draw it in a different color. There's going to be a rail up top that will be toothed, just like the uh, inner gear. And this will be connecting to the front inner gear. So there'll be teeth like this. and it will be meshing with the inner gear. And then there will be a, so this is moving. And then there is a stationary outer gear, or sorry, outer, uh, or stationary rail for the outer gear. So there's a rail here like this. And basically what this assures is that there can be no slipping. So in other words, the gears are going to assure that there is no slipping, that kind of thing. Then I'm told that uh, I have the diameters of these things. I have, the inner gear has a diameter of 150 millimeters. 
or sorry, of 100 millimeters. And the outer gear has a diameter of 150 millimeters. Then I want to label some points. The center will be point A. Actually, maybe I'll do that in maybe a different color, maybe green or something. Uh, the center will be point A. The upper part will be point B. The upper uh, point will be point B. Um, point D. And down here, where it makes contact with the bottom rail, is going to be point C. All right, and then I am also told the velocity of point A, and the velocity of point A is going to be 1.2 meters per second. Uh, 1.2 meters per second. You know what, that doesn't look half bad. That's, I've done worse, so. Uh, it's, I would not try to build a gear like that. Now, I, that would actually be quite humorous if uh, after I said, that doesn't look so bad, the next time someone comes in with like a 3D printed something that they captured from my image and say, it doesn't work, I printed exactly what you drew. But please don't do that. Um, anyway, well, if you do, I'll just say, well, it wasn't my drawing that was the fault, it was the printer screwed up, obviously. <laughs> oh, a funny man. Okay, anyway. Uh, keep dreaming. Uh, anyway. The question was if that was extra points if someone actually did print off my crappy drawing. Uh, anyway. If you yeah, if you print it out and it actually works, yes, then you'll get lots, then you'll get a good amount of extra credit, yes. If you can print it out and it actually miraculously works, then maybe you'll get some extra credit. And then you need to explain something about how. Then you only do explain how, yes. Uh, well, no, I mean, it's, the, the how is obvious. It was, per, it, was, it was drawn perfectly right the first time. Uh, I, I think we mentioned this a bit, bit before in the previous class. This is a perfect circle. I mean, I think I mentioned that last class, right? It's just we're feeling it wrong. Well, yeah, it's just uh, optical distortions by air currents in the room. That's all it is. And even if you're watching this at home on your laptop or something, it's just the small amount of air currents between yourself and the screen. And, and if you look in, if you try to look at the screen really closely, well, then that's chromatic aberration in your retina or something um, causing that. So, so don't worry about that. And also pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. So uh, anyway, uh, so anyway, that's the basic system. And all of this is given. And I want to find, uh, let's find the angular velocity of the gear. Uh, find the angular velocity, the omega, of the gear. And it will only have one single angular velocity omega, because it's one fixed object of the gear. And uh, b, uh, the velocities of upper rack r. Let's call me, so I'll call this rack r. The velocities of upper rack R of upper rack R uh, and point D, this one right here, point uh, uh, actually, you know what I labeled that wrong. Uh, D should be here, should be on the outer surface. Sorry about that. Uh, D should be here. Um, and upper rack R and point D on the gear. And point D on the gear. Okay, so let's do that thing I said. All right, so let us consider this then. Ooh. Um, so. Well, I know that uh, the point C, uh, the point C has an instantaneous velocity of zero. It is in contact with the fixed gear, or the fixed rack. Remember, the rack at the bottom has no velocity. Um, it, is, it, it is stationary, an instantaneous uh, velocity of zero. So it will not be permanently zero, but at that instant it must have a velocity of zero. An instantaneous velocity of zero. Um, again, in, and because of this, because of this, this must be 
the uh, gear's overall instantaneous center of motion or rotation. Center of rotation. If there is any point on an object that in, in a particular instant is not moving, that must be the center of rotation. Uh, gears instantaneous, instantaneous center of rotation, if I can talk without tripping over my own words. Uh, Alright, so I know that. So now I can treat everything as if it's rotating about a uh, point C. So now let us analyze this as treating the whole thing like it's rotating about point C. So suddenly this becomes a lot easier to analyze. Let me draw two perfect circles. Oh, turned into an erase. Uh, a little bit lumpy perfect circle, but that's okay. So um, here, actually let me, I think I wanna make it a bit bigger than that. Maybe a little bit bigger. There, perfect circle. And another perfect circle inside it. Perfect circles every time. So there's point C here. Kind of looks like a fried egg. Um, then uh, I'm going to analyze all of this as if it is rotating about point C. So, oh, what did I do? Okay, there we have that. I'm gonna have uh, point B and then VB. B and VB. I'll have point A and VA. And I'll have a D here. And I know D is gonna be rotating like this, so I'm going to, I'm gonna have VD going up at a 45 degree angle here. VD here, and then I'll have some radii. Well, this is going to be, the radius of A here is going to be the actual radius of the, uh, of the wheel, and that's going to be 150 millimeters. But then the radius of point B is going to be twice the radius here, or actually no, sorry. B is not up there, it's up, oh, I've done, I've ruined everything forever. I erased too much. I've seen too much. Yeah, the, that just doesn't exist, yes. But that just, not want to erase? Okay. Yeah, it's somehow even better than before, yes. Um, anyway, so B here needs to be on the, uh, the top here. I need uh, VB to be here. VB. And I will label the radiuses as shown. So I have the 150 millimeter uh, radius to VA, but then it will be 250 millimeters to B. And really, all of these, uh, all of these uh, are, wait, what just happened? There seems to be something weird with my program here. I guess I was clicking on the wrong button or something. So let me just fi fix this one more time. What on earth is happening? Um, that is weird. Is something like dirt on the stylus or? <coughs> Maybe. I think it was the Russians before I came in. Yeah, it's the Russians are hacking my, uh, Okay, you know what? Uh, let's just call it a, a, not a day, but call it a thing there. Yeah, we're done. We'll come back and finish this in a bit. All right, thank you for watching, and we'll be back shortly for part two.